Hello again, friends. Today, I am very excited to talk to Megan McAllister about the changing face of our workplaces as people are starting to come back in. And Megan, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is something I just read this morning about how many leaders are struggling, if not completely overwhelmed by the pace of change and trying to manage a workforce in this environment. What are you seeing and hearing from your clients? A uh, great question, Joanna, and I think a really uh, relevant observation that that leaders are are feeling challenged these days. Um, when I'm when I'm working with my clients right now, I mean the pace of change has been so significant for going on a year and a half now. You know, at the start it was how do we get people working remotely and how do we sort of work in this hybrid work environment, and now we're on the opposite side of that where it's figuring out how to reintegrate and what out of everything that we've learned in terms of policies of remote work or hybrid work, um, what's, what's gonna stay? So where the orientation at the beginning was, this is a change that's of a temporary nature. Now it's like, well, well what sticks, right? And what permanent changes do we wanna make? And, and if so, what aspects of our culture need, need to change in order to make that so? So leaders are charged with a lot of this work and it's change management on a huge scale. And I think we can recognize that humans don't love change, right? There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of management that, that comes with change and just managing people's responses as well. And you think about this within the context of leaders also needing to hold space for all of the emotions that people have been having over this past year and a half. And as much as there's a light at the tunnel at the end of the pandemic, we can't underscore the fact that there has been emotions and trauma and anxiety. And in many cases, leaders are the ones that are holding space for all of that. So this observation that leaders have a lot on their shoulders is absolutely valid. It's something that I'm hearing about a ton from my clients. And in terms of what we need to be thinking about, I really think about leaders in self-care and, and healthy boundaries right now. If leaders are gonna continue showing up and being the ones to you know, sustain leading this change and sustain supporting other people, uh, there is a really um, great importance of them putting on their own oxygen mask on first so that they can do this. Right. So you can help others. Well, it, you know, it's not dissimilar to being a parent or anything like that. And then the advice that you've always had is if you don't look after yourself, you're no good to anybody else. And yet I think leaders are probably being pulled in a couple of different directions because the expectation is, oh, my God, you have to be here to manage this. You have to be here to support us and make space for us, as you say. Uh, so how did what's the best way for leaders to balance their own needs with the needs of everybody clamoring for their support? Mm -hmm, great question. Um, I think it first starts with that mindset shift, right? That you you are at your best for everybody else when you're showing up for yourself first. And I think that hasn't necessarily been modeled or taught to many people, right? Um, we're taught to put the needs of, of others or workplace or our family first. So fundamentally, it's this mindset shift where shift to where it's that self-care is not a selfish thing. Self-care is actually a way for us to show us in our most powerful way so that we can be there for other people. And then it's a high degree of self-awareness. It's, it's knowing yourself. It's knowing what your triggers and your traps are when you get stressed out and being able to be honest enough with yourself when that kind of stuff is happening, when you're getting grumpy, um, when you're getting resentful of someone else taking a day off and you haven't taken a day off in a year, all of those things might be signs or indications that you're not putting number one first. So it's being really honest and really reflective about how being overwhelmed or stressed out or just not being at your best, how that shows up for you. So I think that brings us to one of the things that you're one of the themes you're really passionate about, and that's this whole notion of psychological safety. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you're describing creating psychological safety for yourself, but then mm -hmm. how do people go about create, what does it actually even mean and how do you create it in your workplace? Uh, thank you for asking. You know that I'm super passionate about this, Joanna. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> So psychological safety is uh, a belief that people can take interpersonal risks at work and they can do that without fear of there being consequences. Um, so the interpersonal risks, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, it can be everything from being who you fully are at the workplace, your full identity, bringing your full identity at the workplace and not feeling like you have to leave, it, leave a piece of yourself behind. It can be being real about your current experience. And if your current experience is that you're having mental health challenges or you're experiencing burnout, that you feel safe in order to be able to say that. Um, psychological safety is also being able to put up your hand and say, I think something's wrong here. I think there's something that we need to pay attention to. So um, it's all about being able to fully express in the workplace without worrying that your expression is gonna mean 
that you're going to be a member of the out group or someone's going to demean you or put you down or there'll be consequences to your employment. Um, so when we think about, and I love your positioning of creating psychological safety for ourselves as the start point for creating it in our work environment. Um, I, again, I think the start point is really self-awareness. Um, I think where people get this term psychological safety wrong a little bit is they think that it's all about um, really bad, egregious, like bullying behaviors, right? But there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that happens before that that might make a workplace psychologically unsafe. So the best way that I know to create more safety in a workplace is to have all of us increase our level of self-awareness in terms of the impact that we have on other people. And, you know, working in HR for so long, I've had a lot of closed door conversations with people. And if there's something that I know to be true is that we all impact each other more than we realize. And our moments that we're not showing up as our best and where we're stressed out and when we're not checking ourselves and not recognizing the impact that we have on other people, it really can have a big impact on other people. So if all of us can just get a little bit more conscious about the way that we're showing up and the impact that we have on other people, I think that will go a long way. Um, that's not to say that we can't have a bad day and that we're not going to be stressed out from time to time. We're all imperfect human beings. Of course, that's going to happen. Um, but if more of us can be regularly conscious to try to minimize that impact, I think it's going to be a really good thing. Um, I also think it is we need to think about not just our position of how we feel at work, right? So we might be at a certain level in our career or within a certain team where we feel psychologically safe, where we feel like we can fully express, we have no issues. That doesn't mean that that's the experience of everyone around us, right? So can we have self-awareness, but can we also think about the experience of other people and look around in a meeting and kind of try to make an observation? Does it seem like everyone feels safe or feels comfortable speaking up? Or do we notice that there's some people holding back? So it's looking at ourselves, but also looking outward to other people and being curious about what their experience is and being curious about how you can use your, your position, your leadership, your privilege in a way that can make people feel better and more safe at work. So there's one big thing that we all need to start working on. Let's talk a little bit about as people start to re-enter, as people are starting to go back to the office and some people are resisting going back. Can you have fully integrated high performance functioning teams in a hybrid environment, do you believe? Oh, that, that's the big, that's the big million yeah. dollar question, I think, right now. Um, I think we can achieve a lot more than we originally thought we were capable of. I think when all of this happened, there was a lot of organizations that didn't think it was possible to have people working remotely in a productive way. And I think we certainly proved that notion wrong. Uh, employees have been incredibly productive um, from, from work. So I think we've been really surprised. So I think there's gonna be some challenges in, in figuring out this, this hybrid notion, right? Because we need to think about the fact that there's gonna be a different employee experience as to whether they're in the office and whether they're at home. And that actually brings up some questions around psychological safety. Will people feel as included if they're in the remote camp? So right. there's some stuff that needs to be worked out. And I don't think that anyone has all of the, the answers as to whether it's gonna work or how it's gonna work. And I think it's gonna depend on, on each company and their culture. Um, but I very much have this notion that the things that we didn't think were possible, uh, we've been proved wrong with that. And I think that organizations are, are, are being forced to be more flexible because now that people have got a taste of some of this flexibility and this work from home, they're frankly going to demand more of this flexibility. Um, what used to be a unique benefit in terms of being able to have flexibility to work from home is not such a unique benefit anymore, right? Lots of organizations are offering it. So I think organizations are going to need to figure out how to make it work in this hybrid way so that it can work for a number of different people. I was talking to a labor lawyer recently, and, uh, and he was sort of mulling around this whole notion of who goes back to the office and who stays home. On the one hand, it's great to have that flexibility to be at home, but his concern was that people are, because they're not getting the face time mm -hmm. in the office, they might be overlooked for projects or promotions or mm -hmm. just by you know taking that backseat, if you will, of working from home. What do you think of that? Is there a way to get around that danger? I think we have to be really intentional and there has to be conscious thought about what the impact can be, particularly when you have um, some employees working in the office and some employees working remotely. So these are all the processes, process, 
processes, systems, structures, ways of being in the workplace that frankly have to be like reimagined with this consciousness of like, how can it create different experiences for people? Um, so I don't know what the, what the answer is to all of that other than to say like, we need to think about our meetings. We need to think about how are people gathering? What's the experience? How are people being able to contribute? And we need to reimagine how that can happen when we have employees that are working remotely and employees that are working in the office as well. That is the challenge for leaders and managers and HR departments going forward to figure out how to facilitate that connection and also that, that fairness is, is what you're talking about in the example that you gave. So you were an HR director for a number of years. If you were to be sitting down with some of the employees in an organization right now, how would you counsel them to make a decision about their, their home, their remote versus in office future? What would be some of the considerations you would make them think about? Um, I think that they would really need to think about um, themselves and their best ways of working and what makes them feel good. What's really interesting is that some people love this work from home experience and some people really don't. So we're all different in terms of how we work best, in terms of the human needs that we're looking to get fulfilled from work. You know, for some people, the, the need for connection that really gets fulfilled in the workplace. For some people, not so much, right? So you have to really think about what are your best ways of working so that you can show up with good performance and have a good career. Um, but you also need to think about what you know about yourself in terms of your human needs and, and what you're looking to the workplace to fulfill. Um, and that's presuming that employees would be getting a choice as to what they, um, as to how they're working, which, which I hope that many people do. Right. So now that you are out on your own as an HR consultant, what is the next thing you're really excited about digging your teeth into? Oh, thank you for asking that. This whole notion of workplace culture and changing workplace culture is something that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, I think that the pandemic has caused this, this big reset, right, and in, in how we work and what is expected of workplaces. And I think there's some really great opportunities to lead in a way that's, that's more conscious um, and that really supports people in you know, what they're looking for in their workplaces and in their lives as well. And it requires a different type of leadership, um, you know, one that taps into human needs and connection and inspiration and, and compassion. And I think that's really exciting. And I think that, you know, I very much believe that that way of leading will have really good impacts on the business. It's not just soft, fluffy HR stuff. It's, right. it's the type of leadership that will actually get you business results. And it's also a way of leading that is um, much more helpful for people and, and helping people to find fulfillment in, in their careers and ultimately in their lives. And that gets me super, super excited to be a part of that. Well, I really love the way you position it in, in saying that happy people are more productive people and it does directly impact the bottom line because sometimes it's been treated as, you know, touchy-feely, soft and, and not really contributing. But I really like the way you position it that this is not just good for people, but good for business. Thank you. And I, yeah, I believe that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much, Megan, and all the best to you, my dear. Uh, thank you so much, Joanna. Bye for now.